Going Hello world, we're here for episode two of Charity Charge TV. Joining us today is Dan Austin from Div Inc., a friend of mine, and we were catching up the other week and I thought it'd be wonderful to have you on as a guest, so thanks so much yeah, thanks for, inviting. for joining us. Um, this is, as I mentioned before, our, just our second episode, but we're pretty excited about live streaming and bringing to the world um, just different topics about social entrepreneurship, how people can get involved in the tech community, how people can give back. And um, today I think it's a pretty relevant conversation. So you had recently started Div Inc and that's what we were catching up on. Do you mind just for a second for the audience to tell them a little bit about what Div Inc is and a little bit about your background? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, Div Inc is a nonprofit organization that's focused on championing uh, diversity in the tech sector. We, we focus specifically on the tech startup ecosystem. Um, and just by way of background, I mean, the uh, uh, diversity in the tech sector is just abysmal. Uh, women and uh, ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans and Latinos, are vastly underrepresented in the tech sector. And we can get into the, you know, why that's important and why it's important for, for companies to, uh, to be proactive about being diverse. And we're starting on the ground level. So we're bringing in companies that are diverse from the get-go, and, and I think we're going to build some really strong, uh, and celebrate some really strong companies when we talk about the project. Sure, and I think probably what's helpful for you know the audience at large that's, wa that's watching is, you know, with the rise of kind of internet 2.0 and, and everything that's transpired with the advent of Facebook and social media platforms being at scale, the cost to do a company, a new startup, you know, a lot of people are jumping in the game and doing that, and as a result, you know, over the past 10 to 12 years, accelerator programs have been created. So, um, you know, the top one that comes to mind is Y Combinator. Um, Airbnb and so much of other companies came out of that. And so that model has started to become replicated. Mm -hmm. The idea is to take young entrepreneurs that might have a great idea or they might have, you know, a background that's, that's in software development or something of the sort and just surround them with resources in a program that helps get their company kind of from point A to point B. You might right. be able to talk a little bit more about that, kind of just at large, the, the, what an accelerator serves to do. Yeah, sure. So what accelerators do by and large is provide uh, startup, uh, startup companies and founders with access to critical resources, right? So um, like we at Div Inc, we uh, provide our companies with uh, uh, comprehensive programming on everything from, you know, how do I build a market strategy? How do I, how does product development work? How do I develop my product? Uh, you know, how, wh what's my, what's my revenue model? Like, how is this company actually going to make money? Uh, you know, what do I need to know about um, intellectual property law and how I need to protect that? And it's, it's, it's the fundamental uh, concepts that uh, founders should be familiar with as they get going, but also give them a preview into sort of the next several years of growing and scaling and running their companies. And so that's kind of one of the resources. The other resource is uh, an access to uh, mentors and a network of advisors, folks that you can reach out to and you know, answer questions or open up doors, um, can champion your company uh, and champion you and, and help you uh, grow and scale your business and turn it into a viable uh, tech startup. And the third is access to capital, right? So connecting those dots uh, to, uh, to, you know, I heard an interview with, uh, he's actually now on Shark Tank. So Chris Saka is a billionaire mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he's, he wears his cool cowboy shirts and seems like a really cool guy. I've never met him, but. Um, Maybe we'll have him as a future guest. <laughs> he should have been a future guest. Chris is out there. But he, he made a, a comment in an interview that, you know, basically said, look, you know, I, I invest in companies that reach me through my network. Well, how on earth do I get into Chris Saka's network, right? Well, that's kind of what we're aiming to do, right? We, we don't have a direct, direct connection to Chris Saka, but I'm sure we could probably open that, that door uh, you know, if we make some phone calls and make some connections. So we kind of see ourselves largely as conduit, right? If, you know, the, the companies do the hard work. We're bridging that gap to the resources in the community and bridging that gap to individuals in the community that can, can help them. Individuals and companies that can help them. So um, several of our sponsors and other folks have offered to do in-kind sponsorships to come in and put on workshops for the companies. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah, and I think probably what's, you know, most relevant to my passion and what we're doing at Charity Charge and just everything we were talking about is, you know, there's this notion of social impact companies, you know, 
um, whether it's you know, what we're doing mm -hmm. or you even look at a company, you know, a consumer brand like a Tom's, right? Mm -hmm. It's integrated social impact and doing good directly into their business model. Obviously, a lot of companies that are focused on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that what's really special and in part, you know, another reason why I really wanted to have you on here to share this with, with the audience and talk about Viv Inc. is that I haven't seen enough of a focus of taking a step above that. So again, you have a lot of companies that have business models focused around doing good, mm -hmm. but how about thinking more holistically about having a social impact accelerator or diversity based accelerator that helps create, you know, those types of companies and bring people into uh, start startups, right? And I think that kind of the elephant in the room or the obvious thing is that a lot of companies, um, especially, you know, the individuals that have been able to get access and go through a Y Combinator or 500 startups, or I would say even a capital factory here, if you look again on a macro level, just wall of large numbers, it's usually a lot of affluent people coming from good backgrounds. And I'd like you to mention a little bit, because what I thought was interesting, you talked about how, um, what even some of like the, the criteria would get in, like, can you quit your job? Can mm -hmm. you just, mm -hmm. you know, so you talk a little bit about where you think um, some of the existing accelerators have um, left out, you know, this part of the market and how, you know, you're helping to create a model to um, further get uh, people from diverse backgrounds into tech startups? Yeah, so let me, uh, let me I guess, take a step back and, and kind of set the table with uh, giving sort of a big picture of uh, sort of the landscape, right? I mean, you know, we kind of wash over the fact that the tech industry, uh, you know, has a lack of diversity, but what does that really mean? So just to kind of throw out some numbers out there. Um, the, the, so I'll do a comparison of the tech sector versus sort of the, the, the broader private sector in the country, um, you know, women make up 48% of, um, of, uh, <laughs> sorry, that distracted by something that was going off, like going off camera. Um, we're what, still getting our, uh, <laughs> the kinks worked out over here and all, so we can, we can make light of all the situations here. Anyway, we're so, broadcasting from beautiful, you know, Austin, the beauty Texas, of live television. In uh, my apartment and everything. So full disclosure, I was looking for yeah. our camera, but I'll yeah. just go ahead and uh, <laughs> So anyway, uh, you know, women make up 48% of the, uh, of the, uh, private sector overall, private sector workers, but in the tech sector, they make up 35% of the okay. workers. Um, African Americans make up 14, close to 15 percent of the overall uh, uh, private sector workforce. Uh, they make up close to seven percent, or just above seven percent of the uh, of the tech industry workforce. Latin uh, Latinos is a similar drop off, so it's I think close to 14 percent and seven percent respectively. Um, you know, and those numbers just get worse as you go up the chain. So if you go up into uh, executive and management positions. Um, I think it's something like 20% uh, are filled by females uh, and uh, uh, three per, no, less than 2% are filled by African Americans and 3% are filled by Latinos. And the problem is particularly acute with uh, technology startup founders, mm -hmm. right? And so the metrics are hard to, uh, to gauge. So one metric that we look at is what companies are receiving venture capital financing. And we could look at accelerator programs or you know, what are some of the metrics of success. Um, I think a, a one that's often cited would be sort of the companies that are receiving venture capital financing. And so, um, you know, one percent of uh, tech companies that are founded by African Americans receive venture capital financing. Or, I'm sorry. So, of the venture capital financing that, that's out there that goes to companies, one percent goes to companies that are founded by African Americans. Wow. Similar number with Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the numbers that really boggle my mind are of the companies that receive venture capital financing, 15%, only 15% have women on the executive team, and only 3% have a female CEO. Yeah, can we can we just stop there for a second? Yeah. So um, I want to ask you, why is that the case? I mean, is it is it a strict um, profiling or potentially racism or? I mean, what, do you, what are some conclusions around those numbers? Uh, yeah, I mean, be overly controversial or something. No, like, I, the diversity is probably say something pretty interesting when you talk about only 1%. Yeah, you know, no, I think, uh, I think it's, it's uh, the lack of diversity in the tech industry is, is the opposite of an orphan. I mean, it has multiple parents, right? So um, everything from uh, unconscious biases, right? Like if I'm a VC, a lot of VCs do a lot of pattern matching, right? Mm -hmm. And so, 
you know, subliminal or not, or, or unconscious or not, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you're looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg, you're probably looking for a white male that's, you know, Harvard dropout. Right, there's, there's a lady, lady, you're right, you know, sure. and, and, um, and then there's, yeah, I think a lot of, uh, and by the way, actually, I want to say something that's interesting, because sure. a lot of, as you say that, what a lot of people don't realize, they think of VCs, like venture capitalists, and they think of these almighty, powerful, you know, really rich um, men or women that are making investments. Mm -hmm. But actually, what's in large part driving their decision is they have very wealthy, what are called LPs, that actually give them the money to manage. Right. So part of, I think, what's going to be a natural connection for them to have a bias is, if I bring back this investment that I said I'd made, will it fit kind of the criteria to piss off my LPs or make them happy, right? So it's interesting, as you say, I'm just thinking about, yeah, this, yeah. it extends deeper than just that necessary individual that's making the check. I mean, these VCs, they're the, they're the general partners, but they've got the LPs that are their bosses that are giving them the money to invest. And I'll say one more thing just on that point for anyone that's, you know, that's joined us that might not know a ton about the venture capital world, but um, in order for a venture capital firm to have money, and invest it in other startup companies. There's always exceptions to the rule, but this is generally how it's done. Venture capitalists will form a venture capital firm and they will go out and solicit pension funds or wealthy individuals and they'll say, hey, you know, you give me $10 million, you give me 15, you give me five, we'll pull all that money together into one fund. And then from that, the venture capitalists will be able to make investments. That's right. So they've always got a boss and someone that that they've got to, you know, look good to and, yeah. and show, you know, stuff. So. Sure, and th that's a, that's at the venture capital level, right? right? So those are the institutional investors. Um, you know, I could, it depends on how far down you just rather where you want to yeah. go. I mean, I could talk about this all day about um, the venture capital model in many ways uh, is flawed. Um, I think both venture capitalists, I think limited partners would admit that. So a lot of these, um, it's not so much that the venture capitalists feel a pressure to, uh, invest in companies that they think are going to please their limited partners from a profile standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's more, quite frankly, an absence of pressure from the limited partners to weigh in and put pressure on the uh, on the venture capitalists to look for diverse companies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are you seeing so on that point? Are you seeing um, funds out there that are set up to specifically? invest in you know minority like yeah i have seen that yeah yeah i sure okay, have cool. yeah i've seen that uh personally i've seen that out in the bay area I uh -huh. that well no i have seen that let me, let me take that back there are uh, there are uh, several uh smaller funds here in austin mm -hmm. that, are, that are doing that um, i'm not so particularly uh familiar with what's going on, on the east coast in that regard but um but yeah uh, it's, it's definitely something we're seeing uh, like Sarah Brand and uh, Carrie Rupp have recently started a, a, a fund here in Austin that focuses on uh, uh, investing in companies that are, that are founded one by women, for instance. Um, there's a VC named Marlon Nichols out in the Bay Area that has a fund that's out there that, uh, that is looking at uh, largely uh, African American uh, founded companies, right? And they're, they're unlocking these uh, market segments. Gotcha. Um, maybe a lot of traditional VCs uh, wouldn't necessarily think to go after. Cool, great. So I mean, it's a little bit on capital. I want to jump back specifically to Div Inc. and what you're doing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, maybe you can give an example of a specific company. So. Um, but before we get off that topic, yeah, I, mean, I did sure. want to, okay. you know, we mentioned the unconscious bias, but yeah. um, you know, that's not the only thing. I mean, you know, part of it is. Um, it goes back to the, what exactly what it is that we're um, providing these companies uh, or that we seek to provide these companies, which is um, the access to that mentor network. Right? That may be something that comes a little less naturally to, you know, if you're a woman founder or you're an African-American founder or Latino founder, um, uh, you may just not naturally have access to, to, to folks you can kind of reach out to and call, um, uh, you know, and there are other factors that you can, you can Gotcha. But, uh, yeah, that's great. How are we doing out there on the internet? How's the live stream? Good. Got some viewership. <laughs> nice. You got any, any comments? <laughs> Should I ask if there's any questions that you have about uh, the topics that we're discussing here for Dan or charity charge related or social <laughs> impact? Feel free to, to send them our way. And we'll, we'll be sure to answer them. Um, I want to talk a little about Divink. So can you give an example um, of kind of how, how you roll out your program and you, you started with your, your first class, you're kind of in the 
throws a wrapping night off and gearing up yeah. to, to a demo day. Yep. Um, can you give some examples of maybe like one or two of the companies and, and how you guys have been able to help them or at least what they were seeking to get out of it and, and, and how they progressed? Yeah. Through? Um, well, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to shamelessly plug, uh, all the companies. So we have our demo day coming up, uh, next Thursday at five 30 at Google fiber, which is an incredible space downtown. It's awesome. I've heard for doing had presented there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it is actually. We are not currently sponsored, although we'd love to be sponsored by Google, but I'll just say, yeah, it's a wonderful space. It's yeah. the nice thing that they did for the Austin. So I got my cheat sheet here to go and make sure I don't get anybody. But uh, so VWIN and Monchu are the founders of Home Ads, uh, which is a marketplace for month to month rentals. You can check them out at homeads.com. Incidentally, all these companies have profiles on our webpage. So you can go cool. to divinc.org and, and, and check out a profile of all these companies. But Wayne Lopez is a co founder and CEO of IUPA which helps casual adventure seekers uh, rent gear by saving them up to 80% off the cost of purchase gear. Their tagline is, you know, rent the adventure or buy the adventure, not the gear, right? So you get to your destination and, and you get the gear when you get there rather than trying to lug it all across the country. To, to I hate checking bags. bags. That's awesome, <laughs> actually. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Dr. Sherard Houston is the co-founder uh, and CEO of Confirmed X, which is a healthcare network service that connects everyone in healthcare on a single HIPAA compliant platform that integrates uh, appointment booking, referrals, uh, and emergency or emerging care online check-in services. Uh, Yishan Yang is the founder of Mama English, which is an education mobile platform and step-by-step -step curriculum that teaches English to folks in China. Uh, Kelly Ernst is the founder of Read Denim, which is a marketplace for designer jeans and affordable, uh, for affordable lease through uh, a membership program. Uh, Adriana Contu is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Revealix, which is a healthcare company developing software solutions to reveal adverse skin conditions before the harm occurs. Uh, Bobby Medifee is the founder and CEO of Plume, which is an application-based solution to build uh, credit. Uh, Tito Salas is the CEO of Coders Link, which is an organization that connects U.S. companies with top talent in Latin America. And Lily Q is uh, the founder of Howley LLC, which develops leading motion tracking technology uh, to enable a wide range of applications in, in entertainment, uh, education, safety, and healthcare. And they're in the AR VR space currently. Uh, so I just want to make sure I hit all those companies before. Uh, before we went any further, no, I'm just to let you know that they're gonna, I mean, they are, they are kicking ass and they're gonna come out on Thursday and just put on an absolute amazing uh, demo day. You 538 there, just come on out and support these uh, companies and, and check them out. That's cool. Can we put, that's on your website, those details? Um, yeah, cool. Can we put, add that as like a link um, on the comment to DivInc and to check out the demo day? Sure, cool. Let's yeah, so. Uh, can we also get, you're gonna be able to take some photos too? As well, at some point. <laughs> Great. Great. All right, cool. Our, uh, <laughs> our friend Russell Briscoe says hello from Africa. Oh, oh wow. Wow. wow! Hey, Russ. Hey, Russ. Russ Briscoe. Thanks Man. so much. Uh, he's a, he's a charity charge card holder, so I want to give him a shout out for charging it forward. Uh, yeah. good, good friend of ours, actually from Austin. He is in Africa in Morocco right now with an awesome company called Globe Kick. Wow. You can check him out at globekick.com. And what they do is essentially, if you think of st what study abroad is for students, yeah. they do, it's work abroad. Um, so currently, and they have, they're going to be rolling out different formats, but their current uh, way that they roll it out is for three months, people, people register and become part of this Globe Kick cohort. And they take on each month to a new city where they've already set up housing, co-working space, tours, they, they do yoga and like health and wellness and stuff. Um, so it's pretty cool. And so uh, Russ is uh, is running that with uh, another good friend of ours, uh, Jamie the Bull out there. So, wow, that's awesome. So yeah, yeah thank, thanks for tuning in, Russ. Really appreciate the support. And uh, you can check those guys out. Russ, I wish you'd found that like 20 years ago. There might have been something that would help you out. Maybe, maybe you could do <laughs> a Div Inc. <laughs> Accelerator program <laughs> yeah. on a globe tear. Russ, we need to talk about this. Yeah, we get out there. That, um, that's awesome. Okay, so back to your question about uh, how we help the company. So, and I'm not going to call these companies out specifically, yeah. but um, but so just to take another step back and and, and sort of talk about um, you know, we're a pre-accelerator program. So, as the name would indicate, you know, there are three pathways out of the program as we see it. So, the first one is um, you know if you're a company and you want to get into a a for-profit accelerator program like a 500 startups or like a Y Combinator or like a Techstars, uh, we provide somewhat of a, uh, a an on-ramp to get 
into that process and, and, and meet those folks. The, the second pathway out of the program is if you don't have any desire to go to a funnel one accelerator program, but you want to just use our accelerator program and come out and start raising money and, and building and scaling your company, um, that's the second pathway. So you can just come on out and do that. And the third is for folks that don't necessarily want to go and raise um, capital, but want to come out and bootstrap, uh, that's the third pathway out of the, out of the program. So going back to how we help uh, specific companies, uh, we have several companies that are interested in going into follow-on um, accelerator programs, uh, specifically Techstars and 500 Startups. And um, Amos Schwartzbarp, who actually runs the Techstars program here in Austin, mm -hmm. has come over and led yeah. a workshop for us. Um, Jason Seitz, who used to run the Techstars program in Austin and is now a venture partner with Techstars, is one of Div Inc's advisors. Um, Clayton Bryan, who's uh, one of the folks at 500 Startups, has led uh, mentor office hours and held mm -hmm. mentor office hours with our with our um, with our cohort companies. And so, uh, you know, rather than these folks at these at these uh, accelerator programs being sort of like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain pulling the levers, you know, we sort of demystify that process and we introduce you to these folks. Uh, so you meet Amos, you meet Jason, you meet Brian, uh, Clayton. So. Um, so we've got companies that are uh, in for follow-up rounds of, of getting into those programs right now. So that's an example of something that, uh, that we've done. Um, yeah, that's great. So I want to actually take a sec, go higher level, like the sure. genesis of, of, of Divin, because something that I think is cool is um, that you guys are a startup. We are a startup. yourself, right? And so I had... Um, you know, of course, you know, what came about of having you here today is that, that we got together and we're catching up at, at your office space at Galvanize mm -hmm. uh, in downtown Austin um, a week and a half ago or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, prior to that, I hadn't seen you face to face since the spring or at some point when you first just shared to me that you were thinking about doing this and we're kind of pulling it together. So right. could you just walk us through a little bit like your experience because your background is kind of an entrepreneur. Sure. You served in the, uh, the military and yeah. went to law school and uh, did a lot of startup foundational formation, uh, startup legal work. Yeah. Um, how did Divin come about? Can you talk just a little about some of those steps? Yeah, that? so um, so uh, Div Inc. was, was co-founded by myself, my co-founders Preston James, uh, Dana Callender, and Ashley Jennings. And um, kind of through serendipity, we came together. Uh, Preston and I first met to talk about this uh, back in uh, late March, I think it was, of this year. And uh, you know, then linked up with Dana and Ashley, and we grabbed this thing and we were all in, and we launched our first cohort uh, midway through September. Um, we all bring a background. I mean, we all have worked, either worked in tech or we've started companies or both. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, my background is as a as a business and technology lawyer. Uh, you know, spent several years here in Austin working with uh, technology startup companies and investors, uh, Austin Ventures, and some other mm -hmm. you know, big institutional venture capital firms, uh, both on you know representing company side, representing the, uh, the investor side. Um, and so, you know, I'm a person of color. You know, I've been out there personally in the wilderness and kind of seen this firsthand. I've seen it with my companies. Uh, Preston's a 20-year uh, executive at Dell. Uh, for the last several years, has been an active angel investor here in Austin. He, uh, as far as we know, is the only uh, African American uh, member of uh, I won't name the name, but uh, the uh, angel investing group that uh, that he's a part of. Um, it's probably the one here in Central Texas. Shout out to, to Preston. <laughs> then. Is he involved with? You t I'm jumping ahead on you. Is he in EIR somewhere? Is that he is. He's an entrepreneur residence at, uh, at the McComb School at the nice. University of Texas. Shout out to uh, to UT. We're kind of trying, yeah, trying to wrap right here for the Longhorns. Yeah, well, I'm a um, UT alum. I went to UT <laughs> Law School. I'm an honorary <laughs> alum. I had worked there for a couple of years, and they put me in there alumni magazine and some other stuff. So, yeah. Uh, they never put me in the alumni magazine. No? No. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe you now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, and and Dana and Ashley, you know, are are entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and two women who have lived this firsthand. So, uh, you know, we're all passionate about this. We all you know, have personal experience working with it. And so, um, yeah, kind of like answering the entire question. I think I think you've done a good job. And so, we talked about um, the, the demo day that's coming up next week. All right, so we're back. We're, we're, we've been trying to kind of push the envelope here. We were trying to... Word from our sponsor. Yes. Uh, 
They're trying to broadcast at 1080p to bring everyone the highest quality video. Yeah, here. They're yeah. trying to it actually crash on us. So yes. We're, we're, we're <laughs> letting his video do it. But, um, thanks we're for trying to broadcast it. Right we're going to finish up here. Yeah. I think there are a few more things that Dan wanted to, to kind of mention and highlight about, um, you know, the importance of, of their work at Diz Inc. And, and how he's Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I want to make sure we dig a little deeper into, you know, why is diversity important? And, um, you know, diversity in tech is important for uh, a couple of reasons. I think there's a social reason, uh, but there's also a, uh, a business reason to be made. So the social reason is that, um, you know, the tech sector is, a, is an enormous driver of, of uh, economic growth and job creation. For instance, uh, uh, the average tech sector worker earns more than twice as much as the average private sector worker generally. Um, and then the tech sector job growth is actually 50% higher than, than sort of the private sector job growth generally. Um, and so to the extent that we're leaving, you know, women and, and folks- What about manufacturing jobs? Well, that's for another guest, I guess. Um, the, uh, um, you know, to so the extent that these, you know, these, these, these demographics that we work with are, are being left out, um, you know, it's just, it's creating a, a, a big wealth gap. I mean, the average white household, um, their wealth is, they have 13 times the wealth of the average uh, black household. Um, the average white household has 10 times the average wealth of the of Hispanic household. So that's the social case we made, right? So if we increase diversity in tech, we're going to sort of start to close that gap a bit. Um, but then the second reason is that these diverse companies actually do better in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, McKinsey found that uh, companies that are in the top quartile in their industry in terms of gender diversity uh, do 15% better, they get 15% better financial returns than their industry average or their, their industry peers. Mm -hmm. uh, for companies that are in the top quartile for um, uh, gender or for ethnic diversity, it's 35%, right? So it seems like a no brainer, right? I mean, if I were a VC, I'd be searching far and wide for these companies. Mm -hmm. and, and you can look no further than do you think because we're going to bring it to you. Um, but, you know, why is that? Well, diverse groups, it's been shown, make better decisions. Uh, diverse work environments are happier work environments. Um, uh, diverse companies are more customer oriented. Uh, and so, you know, if you bring these factors to bear, you know, these companies are, are definitely, uh, I think uh, the founder of 500 Startups calls them undervalued assets, right? If you can find these companies, uh, and again, we're gonna bring them to you, um, you know, you can have some real values there, so. That's awesome. I really appreciate you sharing. It's part of what we touched on um, in our first episode with uh, um, Chelsea Collier from um, Impact Hub. A lot of that was focused on how it's it's a, it's a win win for everyone. Um, when you think about social impact, or you're talking about you know social impact and diversity mm -hmm. and things of that sort, that just the economics. Yeah, it makes it's, sense. I mean, there's no. It's not a net sum game. Yeah, it's yeah. not like you know, if women and and ethnic minorities do better, that you know, white people are not going to do as well. I mean, all boats rise. I mean, yeah, everybody's going to yeah. do well. So uh, I should say white males, but um, yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's a it is a net. That's really good. So. That's, well, I really appreciate having you on here. Yeah, thanks as for having me. me. Yeah, as we as we wrap up, I do want to give a, a little bit shout out. Um, Charity Charge is very happy to sponsor another athlete. Um, our first one was Joe Cristaldi in support of Magic School Bus um, in November when he ran the New York City Marathon and we had him up on uh, our Instagram and everything. He, we made him a custom Lululemon Charity Charge shirt. Tomorrow, our good friend and card holder, Zach Ritter, he supports actually Barbells for Boobs. It's a, it's a uh, nonprofit that, that helps raise money to um, think about uh, breast cancer for women. He's a card holder of ours and we're gonna sponsor him. He's an athlete. He's gonna be competing at Fortitude, Fortitude Fitness in Austin, Texas at Mary Lift Miss. And we made him, thanks to Alexandra Craig and Razor Hoof, print team, Brian, shout out to you for making this. We got him an awesome charity charge singlet to wear tomorrow. So anyone that wants to check Zach out, you can uh, go on down to Fortitude Fitness. Uh, I'll be there at 12.30 p.m. in Austin, Texas, and we'll be cheering him on. Fantastic. That's cool. So thanks so much for coming yeah, out. Appreciate it. Yeah. We'll see everyone on the next episode. Uh, I believe it should be next Friday for episode three of Charity Charge TV. Thanks so much for tuning in.